it's the people that get too tied to their money and they, they get overly emotional in the moment that they could make an overreaction. And so I tell traders, it's a lot like the military. You're, uh, you're, you're trained in the military. You go to Paris Island as a Marine. It's eight weeks at Paris Island. You're scared when the guns are going off in the beginning. But when you leave Paris Island, you're trained to run towards the bullets. Yeah. Well, that's what it is for a professional trader. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been very successful because I've been doing this for 31 years. And as other people were selling, we were buying. <laughs> Welcome to the Steady Trade Podcast, everybody. This is Kim Ann Curtin with Tim Bowen today, and we have a special guest today, Anthony Scarmucci. Uh, Anthony and I met about five years ago at Tim Harrington's Battle Fin, and we had uh, a little conversation about his life and about who influenced him, and we thought that some of his experiences and some of his wisdom would be great to bring to you guys today. Welcome, Anthony. Glad you're well, here. It's great to be here. But the one thing you didn't mention is that we were actually at Battlefin on an old aircraft carrier. So we this were on the true. old USS Intrepid. And so when people think about what's going on today in the actual war with an invisible molecule, think about those men, those soldiers, airmen, and Marines that were on that battleship, uh, which was, in, was commissioned and served the U.S., for about 55 years, if you could believe that. And so it's a pretty amazing story. Uh, yes. But, you know, listen, uh, this is our generation's fight now, so we'll have to see how this thing yeah. shapes up, but I'm pretty optimistic. Yes, it'll be okay. I'm, I'm optimistic too. I am too. Anthony, tell us, tell us your background in your own words. I, I sometimes find it's more exciting for somebody to tell us like what they've lived through already. Uh, so please do. Well, you know, listen, I, I grew up, you know, I'm talking to you from two miles from my home, like where my mom and dad lived. They're married 63 years. I guess they've tried to, we're typical Italians. They've tried to put 200 years of fighting into a 63 year marriage. They've been very successful at that. So um, it's that level of dysfunctionality. So I have an older brother and a younger sister. Uh, my dad was a construction worker. He was a uh, hourly uh, waged crane operator. So he spent 42 years in the construction industry. Uh, and, but they wanted us to get educated. So they were very motivated about that. Uh, but neither of my parents went to college. I ended up uh, uh, going to public high school. I was, you know, public elementary school, obviously public school, Tufts University. And then I went on to Harvard Law School. And the joke in my family, uh, which is a sign of how sheltered everybody is, my mother thought it was Hartford Law School. So I, we're packing the car Labor Day. She's got the map out to go to Hartford, Connecticut. I'm like, <laughs> we're not going to Hartford, Connecticut. We're going oh, to Boston. I mean, so, but oh that's the God. kind of family I grew up in, you know, and that's sort of the yeah. classic uh, traditional joke in my, my house. So I, when I got to Harvard Law School, uh, you know, I never saw the inside of a country club. I never hit a golf or a tennis ball. I never saw the inside of a commercial office building. Uh, just because of the way I grew up and what my parents did, frankly, for a living. So my first job interview, I'll set the scene for you. I'm being interviewed uh, for a job at Goldman Sachs. I'm in a 100% polyester suit and a 100% polyester tie and shirt. I showed up at the job interview fully flammable. I mean, I could have caught fire at any moment. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there with these guys and we're talking about the TED spread and Cotango, and we're talking about volatility indexes, and et cetera. And then the partner walks over to me and he puts his arm around me. He says, hey man, you're a smart kid, but you are the worst dressed person <laughs> that we have ever met. And probably the worst dressed person you know I've ever seen. And I can't bring you to Goldman Sachs dressed like that. So oh typical God. Italian family, I call my mother. She's like, what is this guy talking about? He's crazy, you look fantastic. No, I didn't know what <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got a credit card. I went and bought myself a wool suit at Brooks Brothers and a cotton shirt. Wow. And I went to Goldman Sachs and I got myself a job interview and I mean, a secondary job interview and eventually the job. So I started in uh, investment banking and then I moved over to private wealth management. 
and I spent seven years at the firm. Uh, and then at the age of 32, once I had paid my school debt off, I went and started my own business. And so it was a registered investment advisor where we were offering advice, advice to wealthy people. And we had a small trading fund, which I think is apropos to a lot of your listeners, where we did a lot of hedge fund activity and things like that. And that business was reasonably to very successful. Um, don't confuse brains with the bull market. We, we, we got the business up to a billion dollars. We had good uh, asset flows and a decent track record. And then a firm in New York City uh, called Newberger Berman bought us. And, uh, and they were then uh, sold to Lehman Brothers. So uh, there I was uh, seven years after I'd left Goldman Sachs. I was at Lehman Brothers. And so I got the experience there. Uh, and I stayed there for a couple of years. And then in 2005, I left to start Skybridge Capital, and uh, which I've been doing for the last 15 uh, years, less the 11-day fiasco in the White House. But <laughs> I just want to point out to everybody that I had no network coming out of school. So my entree into meeting people was through politics. So my first check that I ever wrote in a political campaign was to Rudolph Giuliani. In 1989, wow. I wrote him a $250 check, wow. and uh, he lost that election, but we became friends, and he helped me build uh, my network and introduced me to Governor Pataki, and lo and behold, I'm working for Governor Romney, and, uh, and then obviously, I was working for Scott Walker, and then Jeb Bush, and then eventually uh, President Trump, um, but it was never to go into politics. It was really just to build my network, as evidenced by my 31-year career. Uh, but when the president asked me to go work for him, I think sometimes you can get seduced by things like that, even if they're not the best things for you career-wise. So, you know, the good news is I got blown out of there quickly and I returned. And the great thing is if you get fired in Washington and you're on your own business, you know, you can go back to your own business, which of course I did. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I love, I love that you shared this story because I know it's such a unique story mm -hmm. and I, I feel that there's a certain level of, humility when you come from a humble background when you come from a place where you don't know that your suit is not mm -hmm. good uh there there is a level of innocence and naivete that you're not going to be so afraid of certain things but at the same time you have to be open so i think i just want to just pay attention to that little tidbit at that moment when you thought but i am in a good suit and my mother says i'm in a good suit what was it that you attribute to your ability to say you know what maybe i have to listen to this guy and go oh. to you know, listen, I mean, you know, I think you're identifying a lot of things for people. And obviously, your uh, presentations that you're making your podcast, your video cast is about learning and trading and rites of passage. And so I, I would tell you that if you're starting with nothing, not only do you have to be humble, but you have to be intellectually curious. Right. And you have to look for role models and you have to sort of like figure out directionally which way you want to go. Uh, and ask a ton of questions and almost build like your own personal board of directors. So think of yourself as a company and you've got 10 or 12 people that you'll rely on to ask questions of, you know, as you go through, uh, as you go through life. And so, so for me, I just said, okay, I want to be successful. I want to try to see if I can achieve some level of the American dream. I love finance. Um, I love the idea of trading, but I also love the idea of investing because when you think about Wall Street, it's the business of understanding other businesses. Or if you think about trading, in a lot of ways, trading is the business of understanding other people that are trading. You know, John Maynard Keynes, who was incredibly successful as a stock market speculator, in addition to being an award-winning economist, he once said about trading, he says, you know, it's a beauty contest, but I'm one of the judges but it's not for me to identify beauty, but it's more for me to perceive what the other judges think is beautiful. And so once I'm able to do that, then I can figure out where the rhythms are in the markets and I can take advantage of that. And so um, I think for me, the reason why I was so drawn to Wall Street is obviously a people business and it's a, it's a business of understanding other businesses. And so, you know, I know a little bit about pharmaceuticals and a little bit about insurance and a little bit about media stocks and a lot about nothing, you know, unfortunately, but, you know, I have that uh, thin observation of the capital markets and businesses. 
um, but I also have a pretty good idea of human nature. And so one of the things about the stock market, and Warren Buffett said this, and he said it better than me, but I'll, I'll repeat it to your listeners. He said that it's this, the market is the most efficient mechanism yep. <laughs> of taking money away from impatient people and giving it to patient people. And when you're in a crisis like this, I just want people to really think about that. It is an efficient way of taking money away from impatient people and giving it to patient people. So, you know, I may own bonds in my portfolio. They're, they're, I'm sorry, I, I lost you there. It's a you're call. back though. Yep. No, you're, no, you're back. Off. You're good. But I, I uh, just trying to shut that connection off. I apologize. But no I may own bonds in my portfolio right now that are marked down because there was selling pressure in the market. Those bonds now have to be marked to market down 10 or 15%. And a, and a, and a, and a result of which I have a, uh, uh, um, you know, a loss, if you will, but it's an unrealized loss. And the money's coming in on the bond, it's cash flow positive, the stability of the underlying assets that that bond is delivering that cash flow on are secure. And so I know at some point that bond's going back to par and I'm gonna sit on that bond. But yet there's other people that are selling that bond. Right. And now I'm like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to take advantage of their impatience uh, and take the money basically from them. You know, and, and, and another thing traders need to know, and they sort of know this, is that the market is a manic depressive. Yep. On some days the market wakes up and it couldn't be happier and it will pay any price for the securities that you own, any price. And on other days, the market is ridiculously depressed and sour, and it will sell at any price the securities that it owns. And so if you can handle yourself in an even keel, and you can be anchored to the notion that you, you, you can be unemotional about your money, you can make a lot of money trading, you can make a lot of money in the market. It's the people that get too tied to their money, they, they get overly emotional, in the moment that they could make an overreaction. And so I tell traders, it's a lot like the military. You're, uh, you're, you're trained in the military. You go to Paris Island as a Marine. It's eight weeks at Paris Island. You're scared when the guns are going off in the beginning. But when you leave Paris Island, you're trained to run towards the bullets. Yep. Well, that's what it is for a professional trader. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been very successful because I've been doing this for 31 years. And as other people were selling, we were buying. Uh, we did, did we catch the bottom? No. Are we going to catch the top? Absolutely no. Did we make some bad decisions as things were sliding? Yes, we did. But again, the great thing about trading, you only have uh, to win 55, 60% of the time, not even, you know, 53% of the time, you can, be, you, you can make a ton of money. Um, last point. Super important point. It's always worth yeah. emphasizing. Uh, you have to be a big boy or a big girl, and you have to mark yourself efficiently to the market. So if I'm owning something at 10, it's trading at five. Well, I may think it's worth 10, but what's my duration? What's my patience? If it's in my trading account, well, you know what? Maybe I'm, I'm going to cut that loss. I'm going to move out of it quickly. If it's in my investment account, well, maybe I'm buying more of it. You know, if I've got a three-year horizon. So, you know, do a self-assessment and de decide what you are. I own things in a trading account that may or may not be held in my long-term investment account. Moreover, I could have something that's been cut in value in my investment account that I've jettisoned in my trading account. So, so you have to look at it with that level of dispassion and that level of uh, desensitized objectivity. Well, I think that's that's one thing that we brought Kim on to talk about because I think you know and and again you know most of our listeners you know again we're we're the newer traders they're the, they're the guys with the small accounts so most of them are penny stock traders which I'm sure to a guy like you you know they're probably like, oh penny stocks but you know people see these wild moves they want to trade them but I love your advice because I mean listen if you're bag holding Microsoft it's one thing. But if you're bag holding a penny stock, you need to realize that that, you know, you don't identify with this penny stock. This is a trading vehicle. And if you see right. one of these virus plays that's, that's going wild, 
you can trade it, but don't become married to it and think that yeah. that somehow makes you dumber or smarter. Well, yeah. You know, I, again, I in penny that, stocks I, land, we see thousand percent runners. It doesn't mean you're smart. It just yeah, means no, you I, recognize I, get it. I mean, I guess, I guess what I would say, and I don't want to throw a wet blanket on that stuff, but I guess what I would say is anything that's too good to be true uh, <laughs> is likely too good to be true. You know, so when someone offers me this pharmaceutical, it's going to cure everything. I'm like, well, you know, we've got 5,500 years of trying to cure everything. <laughs> it, it, it probably is not going to cure everything. That, that doesn't mean it won't be a hot stock for a period of time. Because remember what I said about John Maynard Keynes, other people will perceive it to exactly. be yep. something that can cure everything. And so you have to make that judgment if you want to be involved in that or not. And so I'm, I'm of the belief, though, that uh, the bias upward for the markets after this crisis is going to be extraordinary and likely asymmetric because you have trillions, not billions, but you have trillions. And so I, before I joined you guys, I had the Skybridge economic team go over the levels of stimulus from the federal government and the fiscal side and from the Federal Reserve on the monetary side. You're now up to 12 trillion dollars of stimulus. So you have a divot in the U.S. economy. So let's just talk fundamentals for a second. It ties back into trading. Yeah. You, you, you have a divot in the economy. The economy's printing a five and a half trillion dollar GDP print per quarter. Uh, if you've lost 65% of your output, that approximately that's what it is, you have a $3.7 trillion hole in the economy. The federal government is going to meet that hole with $12 trillion. So just to put it in perspective, they're going to generate 60% of U.S. GDP on an annual basis to fix the problem. I've never seen anything like that in my life. So so yes, we have a problem right now. People are stuck in their homes. People are uh, you know, not going to restaurants. The economy's grinded to a halt to be very high, but I believe very high, but temporary unemployment. And then all of a sudden that work stoppage will end and you'll be on the other side of this thing with $12 trillion hitting the economy. Uh, if you're trading, you know, I would have a long bias to my trading. Uh, if you're out there, Again, just give me my personal opinion. I think you guys asked me to give that. Yep. If you're out there on the short side, you got to be very careful because oh, yeah. <laughs> the rising tide of that liquidity will lift a lot of these bolts. I'm not saying there won't be stocks that go down. Maybe some of those penny stocks won't. <laughs> they all won't. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not saying it, but I'm just talking about the fundamentals yep. of the core S&P 500, the Dow 1000. Those are likely to rise over the next six to 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I mean, I'm very bullish. I mean, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I actually, I, I love your background. I come from a very blue collar background as well. My dad worked, uh, my dad worked at Federal Mogul as a CNC operator and farmed at night. Um, my mom was a cleaning lady at the hospital. Um, so I'm, I'm as blue collar as I get, but I mean, I'm just so bullish because before this thing whole started, I mean, I know, tons of contractors, you know, tons of businessmen. I mean, my, I used to, I sold the business six years ago and quote unquote retired. But right. my, my, my old partner was, was keeping guys on the job that were drinking because he couldn't hire anybody. And I just think right. I agree with you once this ends and you dump that gasoline on there, I just think we're off to the races, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's irrefutable, but let's see. I mean, a lot of things can happen, you know sure. I mean? Uh, I, I will also make a confession, you guys. I had the information. I was at the World Economic Forum. I had met with two pandemic experts, and I walked out of there saying, okay, this coronavirus, this COVID-19 is going to be a lot like SARS or MERS. It's going to be contained in Asia. And I got that wrong. And I got that wrong up until... Uh, you know, mid-February. And then once I started to see what was going on in Europe, that's when I got concerned. Uh, wow. But listen, but listen, you know, that's another thing. When you're wrong in the markets, be comfortable admitting that you're wrong. Uh, the markets punish egocentrism. The markets punish pride. And so what you have to do when you're trading is you have to eliminate those aspects of your personality 
and just accept, okay, got that wrong, let me move on. Mm -hmm. You can't have post-traumatic stress from your trading losses or post-euphoric right. uh, you know, mania from your wins. Yep. You've got to yep. get yourself in a tight zone in terms of the way you think about things emotionally. So Anthony, I'm, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just I'm just thinking that's just so great that you said this, and I, I I find it to be a fascinating conversation. This combination of needing to have confidence to even be in the game, and also consistently having this humility. I think you are a great example of somebody who comes across really confident. And I've also heard you speak to this concept of humility. So for, for the traders who, you know, look, every, every trader I've ever met, they want to be a baller. You know, they want to be the man. And, right. and that is part of why they have the guts to even jump into this place. And yet, if that gets out of control, then they're going to be in trouble quickly. So how do you personally find that balance between having the confidence, having that kind of moxie, that you do have, and yet also keeping, you know, kind of in this equanimity. So, so listen, I mean, it's, it's hard. And, and, I, and I would be uh, mendacious if I said to you, oh, I've got it figured out. I don't. And I don't want to be one of those self-righteous people uh, leaning into your podcast, trying to tell people I have it figured out. I don't. I'm 31 years into this. And that is a process that I start in the morning and I think about and then at the in the evening, when it, when the day is over from a trading session or whatever, I say, okay, how how did I stick to those concepts? And sometimes I let my emotions overwhelm me, and sometimes I don't. But here's what I will tell you: if you can detach yourself from your emotions on those days, I do way better right. than on days when I'm locked in. And so this is habit forming, and you have to just keep pushing and keep pushing. And I would say something that uh, I think most people who do meditation understand, you have to be present. You, you, you have to try, especially when you're trading, to avoid distractions or to, uh, you know, playing mind games with yourself. You got to say, okay, here are my loss ratios. Here are my stop losses. Here's what I'm looking to make. You know, I'll let this run if it goes in this direction. I'll cut it if it doesn't. It's... Uh, you know, Steve Cohen, who is, uh, runs Point72, is a very close personal friend of mine. He started out as effectively a day trader at Gruntle. He's now one of the richest people in the world. Uh, and he always has a great line about trading. And his, his aphorism is, stay present and get ready to accept losses. And, and the minute you do that, you can build on your gains. But if you can't accept losses and you're digging in, I can't tell you the number of traders they buy, and I'll use an old name, they buy compact computer. They buy it at 30, it goes to 27, okay, I'm gonna buy more. It goes from 27 to 26, okay, they're gonna buy more. And lo and behold, they misreport on the earnings and the stock goes up from 26 to 28, but they started at 30 right. and they lost their money. But the, the thing went up on the earnings because even though the earnings were bad, the price action already happened prior to the earnings release. You see what I'm saying? Yep. And where, you know, if you got flat in there, if you started watching the activity, you say, well, I really don't know what's going to happen here. Let me get flat and let me learn from directionally what happened and see if I can improve my, my game on my next trade. It's that sort of thing. Constant improvement, constant recognition. The minute somebody tells me they've got it figured out and they tell me they're not talking to anybody else because they're the guru. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that is a ticking time bomb. That's yep. someone wearing a trading suicide vest. They're going to explode right in front of their monitor because good traders are talking to other traders. They're uh, using people like you guys, listening to them, listening to their guests. They're taking information in from all over the place. And they're saying to themselves, I may have this right for sure, but I may not have this right. And what am I going to do in the event that I don't have this right? Right. Yeah, that's something, you know, again, back to, you know, the fact that we're dealing with a lot of people that are really new and, and I'll get the questions. It's like, you know, people are asking me, you know, hey, what should I do with this position? And I'm like, man, you got to know that before you get in. You got to have some sort of plan. I mean, and hey, we all made mistakes. I've, I, I started 15 years ago. I've made every mistake in the world. I'm sure, you've made every mistake in the world. But that's one of the first ones is people just, they don't even, they don't even have a plan. And it's like, 
don't, don't ask someone else what you should do. The first step is you should know what you're going to do if you're down 10%, 15%, 20%, you know, I, 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 you know, you, 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 people start moving their, they, they start making a plan after they're already in it and it's too late. You know? Well, we agree. And I and look, I mean, here's, here's the thing though. Uh, having a bad day, things didn't go right. Take a, take a shower, go to bed, start tomorrow and emotionally try to get yourself back to even. Cause if you can do that, then you're ready to attack that day no matter what your losses or gains were from the day before. So your, your way of getting to even, what are some of your practices that help you get to that place of even? Well, you have to relitigate everything. I mean, my, my, my feeling is uh, I try to look at even my investment portfolio. I try to like on a Saturday after I've read the Barons and Investor Daily, all that sort of stuff. I say, okay, here's my portfolio. If, it, if this portfolio was in cash today and given every single thing that I know right now, <coughs> is this what I would want? Because what sometimes happens is if you're holding overnight positions, you get emotionally attached to those positions. You think that drug is going to work. You think that virus therapy is the answer to civilization. And all of a sudden, you're in a rhythm of emotional attachments to things that you shouldn't be emotionally attached to. So... I think the way you make money back when you're losing money is get flat, get to cash, and say, okay, let me start over. Right. Here's where things are in the markets. Here's where I am. Forget about what I made or lost. This is the dollar amount I'm coming into, into the game fresh right here. And if you can do that, and you can program yourself to do that, you, you're, you're, you're invariably more successful. Mm. What characteristics do you think or personality traits are the ones that are, are – if somebody's looking at us and they're listening to this conversation and considering whether or not being a trader is for them, man or woman, regardless of their age, because I think now the age demographic is going to change because of the environment we're in, what do you think are the characteristics? Somebody wants to ask themselves, I have these qualities, so this might be a good road for me. Well, it's, 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 it's a good question. Um, I, I guess, um, uh, you know, we are emotional people. Uh, we act irrational. I mean, we try to pretend we're rational, but <laughs> truth of the matter is we're in general very irrational. And I think you have to make a decision if, if that's a part of your life where you can almost get into a game. I don't want to call it a video game because it makes light of what it is. Right. But if you can position yourself that it is a game uh, and it's a game of wits, it's a game of poker, and you're matching your trading skill set versus other market participants. And I think that the thing that you always have to remember is the market sometimes gets things wrong. It'll sometimes oversell things too aggressively, but there is wisdom in the crowd. You know, if the market is moving directionally in a direction, it could tell you something about things. You know, if you looked at the March 23 trading activity in the U.S. stock market, uh, we went from peak to trough. We hit a low down 36% for the Dow and 35 or 36% for the S&P. But if you looked at the VIX, the VIX traded from 87 to 44 in about two and a half hours. And the last time I saw that happen was in March of 2009 during the final capitulation from the last vestiges of the, of the financial crisis. And, and I guess what I, what I would say to people is – when I saw that happen, it was an indication to me that everything was out of the market, meaning all of the margin players were out, all the loose holders of stock were out, all the margin calls were being met at the bottom of that market. So it was forming a bottom, not necessarily off of fundamentals, but off of the aspects that people got margin calls, they had to meet those margin calls to save their equity, they didn't want to get their accounts taken away from them by an investment bank or a broker. So they, they were forced to make selling decisions that, you know, they may or may not have made had they had more capital uh, that was less margin. Right. So, so what am I getting to? I guess what I'm getting to is in that case, I looked at the market and said, okay, that's way oversold on a technical basis. This market's going to bounce uh, and we're up 30% from that low. And so, so again, is the, think of those securities. Are they 
worth what they were on March 23rd? <laughs> are they worth what they are today on April 9th? What, what are they worth? And the answer is they're worth whatever the market will pay for them. But we do know that there's a long-term intrinsic value to those earnings that should be reflected in the present value of those stock prices. But the flip side is we have to look at what's going on in the market because there's a ton of different players. There's speculators, day traders, long-term investors. There's Warren Buffett. There's a group of people in that market that uh, have different objectives. And as a day trader, you have to understand that. You have to be ready to see the market for what it is as opposed to, to pretend the market's going the way you would like it to see it the way it is which is a non-normative thing you know it's it's mm -hmm. about realism it's not about the word ought you know it ought to go a certain way mm -hmm. another point i would make is a very important one never play the victim with the market yep mm -hmm. bought the stock the stock went the wrong way the market's a bozo this thing's very cheap Okay, but you know, you, you're a day trader. You, 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 you're making a directional bet over a short period of time, cut your loss. You know, if you're a long-term fundamentalist, okay, that's fine. Go in the other direction. That's cool. sort of my alarm bell, guys. I'm sorry, I have to take another call. I'm, uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm no, juggling a lot of different things no today. No problem. Because I'm, uh, uh, I and and actually, I just, I just, I, I, was, I was gonna kind of start taking it home anyway. A um, couple things. I'm curious, you know, obviously you were in the White House for a short term. Um, yeah. You know, you're, are you in New York City? I'm in Hassett. I live on Long Island. Okay, okay. I live, so, I live two miles from my parents. So, so, so obviously being politically corrected, being in finance for 30 years, I, I would like to get what, what's your kind of opinion? Young, 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 young day traders. Hi, <laughs> young. We're all, we're all home in quarantine. Yeah. How, are you, how are you, honey? Are you doing okay at home? Mm -hmm. No, he's loving it. He's loving yeah, it. Yeah. You're, you're having fun. You're getting lots loving. of attention from me, everybody. I bet you are. Oh, it's so so what nice is, what to was see the you. question? I'm sorry. I was, was I was curious, kind of what uh, you know. What, what's your opinion on the response to the virus stuff? I mean, you you mentioned, you know, and I shared your opinion in the beginning too. I was kind of, I didn't think it was going <laughs> to come over. It's here. What do you? How do you feel about the current response? And and how do you feel about I mean, getting, getting I, I, everybody I, I back think, to work? Listen, you know, you know I, I've had my personal differences with, you know, the administration, but here's what I would say. I think it's incredibly hard to shut down the U.S. economy, the largest economy in the world. Right. And yeah. hindsight being 2020, if he had shut the economy down late January, early February, uh, mm -hmm. you probably would not have the number of deaths. You probably would have, like, less impaired the economy. But, you know, I'm not a Monday morning quarterback, so I'm not going to sit here and judge anybody. What I'm very happy about right now is we all seem to be on side from a federal and a state level. And we all seem to be pr practicing the appropriate mechanisms that will end this tragedy and will end this human tragedy and the economic damage. Uh, and the great irony is the social isolation is actually productive. It's almost like putting the economy in an induced coma right. mm -hmm. uh, to save the overall patient. And so if we can just wait it out, I think we'll be very surprised at how well we do when we come out of this. Yeah. yeah. One more question. I don't, I don't want to judge them because right. I know how hard it is to make those decisions. That's, that's yeah. my point too. Yeah. You know, yeah. All, all the Monday morning quarterbacks, I'm like, yeah. Hey, you, you, tr you try and take that job, you know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, last question, we'll let you go. So yeah. again, you know, it's a unique time. People have time at home. There's a lot of uncertainty with the careers and stuff. So say the steady trade listeners out there, he's just started checking out day trading. Maybe he's completely new. You know, what, what, what would your, be your advice to that guy or that gal that's just beginning this journey in these crazy volatile markets? Start small. Uh, don't overly judge yourself. Uh, the worst thing that could happen to a day trader in a market like this is get so many things right. Because right. if you get so many things right, then what starts to happen is you start believing your own BS. And so you don't want to do that. So start small and, uh, you know, sometimes even, you know, put some money out, but also have some paper trades out too. Yep. say, okay, yep. I'm going to get long this. I want to do this. This is my direction. And this way, okay. some of your losses and some of your gains, frankly, show up not in the real world, but they show up as paper. 
Yeah, I, 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 would I, be my I beg, I beg new traders the paper trade. I'm like, listen, you know, <laughs> there's so much you don't know. Try and make those mistakes on paper, you know, right. yeah, versus your exactly. real money. So, Anthony, well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank great, great to yeah. be on with you guys. Thank yes. you, and uh, <laughs> happy, happy Passover and Easter and all those happy things. Happy Passover and happy Stay Easter. Stay healthy. Well. And, uh, my wife and I will be back on the Big Island hopefully before too long. Okay, good. I'm looking forward to seeing you it's in person my then. It's, it's your birthday. birthday. Happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> happy birthday, my friend. Oh. All right. Thank you, All Anthony, right. so much for making time God for bless, us. Guys. Thank All right. You. God bless you Thanks. too. Bye -bye. Aloha. Bye. Aloha.